the preferences of the business class and the um, don donation behavior of the, the uber wealthy um, is getting attention also right now, not just because of its effect on sort of the odds in the race, the, the likelihood of each of these candidates to win. I think it's also getting attention because of the substance of it. Right. We have an incumbent president and somebody who was the last president. So they both have a term in office that we can look at, that we can measure against one another. But they've both got observable records. Why would business people be turning against Joe Biden on the basis of his record, which is what we keep being told in the press heading into this debate? I mean, this is something there's where there, again, is, is an observable truth here. Under Joe Biden, we just had the best year of American job creation in the 21st century. The last time we had a streak this long of unemployment below 4%, it was the early 1960s. Under Joe Biden, the U.S. has the best economy in the world, literally the envy of the world. In fact, the World Bank just said that the U.S. economy is so good, it's actually stabilizing the whole world economy. The U.S. stock market keeps hitting new records and then breaking those records and then hitting new ones that are even higher. Crime is at 50-year lows. We just had the largest single-year drop in the murder rate that we have ever recorded. And President Biden keeps passing, keeps signing big legislation that's good for the economy, that's good for the business climate. And he has been able to do it, miracle of all miracles, with bipartisan support. And that includes the big infrastructure bill and domestic manufacturing of computer trips and all of these other, all of these other things. I mean, this is the kind of business landscape hellscape business leaders have been suffering through under Joe Biden. Headline, headlines like these. Corporate profits hit record high as economy boomed in fourth quarter of 2023. Or this one. U.S. corporate profits soar with margins at widest since 1950. Or this one. Money Watch. U.S. companies just had their best year since before most of us, before most of us were born. Oh, the poor business guys, they really need Trump back, don't they? And even, even if they want to say, oh, it's not about the business climate, it's about being fiscally responsible. It's just that we're so worried about the debt and the deficit, and that's why we want to go back to Trump and get rid of Joe Biden. I mean, tell me what the rationale is there in reality. Tell me what the rationale is. Because the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, one of these nonpartisan fiscal watchdog groups, uh, put this out today, which kind of puts a fine point on it, right? That's, that's who added what to the debt <laughs> when you compare Trump's term in office with Joe Biden's term in office. And no, you can't blame COVID. They actually break out the COVID spending. That's the bit in the lighter red color there. So yes, Donald Trump and Joe Biden both spent on the, camp, on the pandemic. They had to. But even if you wipe that out, Trump added trillions more to the debt and the deficit than Biden did, regardless of COVID. And maybe you don't particularly care about the deficit and the debt, but business guys almost always say they do. And so what's the rationale along those lines for supporting Trump over Biden? As we head into this weird early debate this week, supporters of, of this business genius <laughs> have created an impression that Trump's got an advantage heading into the debate at this point in the campaign because his business record, right? He's so appealing to all the other rich business guys who so appreciate how smart you need to be to book a guy with vampire teeth for your cage match business. <laughs> They are trying to create an impression that there is support for Trump in the business world because there's, you know, economic and business reasons to support someone who himself is so good at business. In reality, the actual stakes in this election, the comparative record of these two candidates on the economy and business, th those, it, it doesn't favor the failed promoter of the affliction mixed martial arts league, which promoted exactly two bouts before it folded. And the man whose surviving company was convicted on multiple felony fraud counts and was named in his own felony criminal trial for falsification of business records. And by the way, his CFO is currently doing his second stint in prison. Weirdly, his business record, his business environment record, his job creation record, his economic and fiscal record on the facts 
doesn't support the idea that he should be winning support from people who prioritize those things. Despite the massive spin generated by all these high-profile, ideological, Trumpy billionaires, we're starting now, finally, as of today, I think, to see a corrective in that narrative about what's really happening. This is the, the front page of the New York Times tonight. Quote, CEOs are frustrated. That doesn't mean they that doesn't mean they embrace Trump. Quote, a number of prominent figures in Silicon Valley and on Wall Street have grown increasingly vocal in their criticism of Mr. Biden, their praise of former President Donald J. Trump, or both. Still, that shift mostly reflects movement among executives who already supported Republican politicians. Quote, there is little evidence of a major shift in allegiance among executives away from Biden and toward Trump. It's on the front page. This is on the op-ed page today. Quote, recent headlines suggest that our nation's business leaders are embracing the presidential candidate, Donald Trump. His campaign would have you believe that our nation's top chief executives are returning to support Trump for president, touting declarations of support from some prominent financiers. It is far from the truth, though. They didn't flock to him before, and they certainly aren't flocking to him now. Quote, Trump continues to suffer from the lowest level of corporate support in the history of the Republican Party. Quote, not a single Fortune 100 chief executive has donated to Trump so far this year, which indicates a major break from the overwhelming business and executive support for Republican presidential candidates that dates back over a century. Trump received a, quote, frigid reception when he spoke to the business roundtable this month with no noticeable applause at any point during his, quote, remarkably meandering remarks, according to CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin, and with Trump assuming a subdued, if not hostile, po posture. Chief executives are not protectionist, isolationist, or xenophobic, and they believe in investing where there is the rule of law, not the law of rulers. Whether or not business support is going to make the difference for either one of these candidates in November. Heading into this debate this week, there has been a concerted effort to create a perception, a false perception, that Trump has the whole business world lining up behind him. And that's because his time in office compared favorably with President Biden, which is not true on fiscal issues. It is not true in the overall business climate. It is not true on jobs. And it is not true in terms of business leaders lining up behind these two candidates. But that kind of false perception itself has political consequences. And heading into this debate and all the attention it's going to get about the, well, the relative strengths of these two candidates and what they have to offer, what they have to offer, excuse me, uh, more than ever, it, it is worth getting these things right. Uh, joining us now is my dear friend and colleague, Stephanie Rule. Thank you for having me. I'm in awe of your lead in. You have laid out exactly the sort of economic landscape of what we're looking like here. And one of the main reasons you're seeing sort of this Trump narrative that all these business leaders are backing me, because remember, the number one thing they want to try to push and convince people of is that the economy is terrible. And while inflation is a persistent problem, business leaders are not standing with Donald Trump. And that business roundtable meeting, it's really important for our audience to understand. Trump would have you believe Corporate America invited me in. They wanted me to speak to them. It was their normal meeting that they have every year, and they invited both candidates. President Biden could not attend because he was at the G7, and his chief of staff, Jeff Zients, was there. And Donald Trump has said since then, they were clapping for me at the end. They were because it was at the end of a presidential candidate's remarks, and that is what a room does who's marginally courteous. But you just mentioned <laughs> the reporting from Andrew Ross Sorkin. I spoke to other people who basically said this thing was all over the place, and it is a break. Pre-Donald Trump, the business community, sort of the C-suite class, was with the Republican Party. You remember that Al Smith dinner years ago when George H.W. Bush kind of jokingly looked out at the room of business leaders in New York and said, you're my base. That's not the mm -hmm. case anymore. It was after Charlottesville, you saw the first business council in, in American history break from a president and say, I can't even be associated with him anymore. Steph, one of the reasons that I think this is important heading into the debate is because 
I'm not a person who knows a ton about the business world. I definitely don't think of myself as sharing all the same values as, as CEOs and, and, and people on Wall Street and people who think of, you know, who, who read the business section first and maybe don't even read the politics page. I don't think of myself that way, but I also know politics reasonably well. And I feel like the perceptions of who the business community is with is an important thing even for people who aren't themselves in the business world, right? Because you start it, to think, oh, well, these, these business people are smart. They must know who's going to be economically better for the country. And that's, I believe, why they're trying to create this perception. And that's why it's important for us to report if that perception is false. Rachel, it's especially important this year because we've had this division, right? All of the positive economic data that you just laid out is disconnected from how people feel because people haven't been feeling good about the economy because they're coming off of COVID because of persistent inflation. So, so when you keep pushing this narrative that the business community is standing with Donald Trump, it, it convinces people, well, maybe bad news is coming. But here's what's important. There are, there is sort of a subgroup of sort of very, very successful Wall Street financiers. You know, they, there's Elon Musk and kind of Elon Musk backup dancers who have been very pro and outspoken Trump, uh, pro-Trump in the last few weeks. And I want to explain why. They know how good the economy is. Elon Musk and all that Joe Biden has done for electric vehicles, he certainly knows how good the economy is. He knows how good the stock market is. However, they know that Donald Trump is transactional. They know that if they stand with Donald Trump now, if they're throwing fundraisers for him, that if, in fact, he becomes the president, they're going to have a direct line into the Oval Office. So it's as though they're trying to recreate kind of a Putin's oligarchs here. If they help Trump now, he will take their call and give them the quote unquote get out of jail free pass six months from now. Now, that is not the Fortune 100 CEOs out there that have all of these constituents, but this small Wall Street universe, the Nelson Peltz, the, the Bill Ackmans of the world, they're putting on the Trump show because they would love to have his kind of power and him in their back pocket if he were to win. It started in Kansas, less than two months after the Supreme Court overturned Roe, after they overturned their constitutional right to an abortion. Voters in red, red, red state Kansas resoundingly stood up for abortion rights in their state. 59% of Kansans voting that abortion should stay legal in that state. A few weeks later, Democrats won a special election for an open congressional seat in a swing district in upstate New York with a candidate who made the loss of abortion rights the centerpiece of his campaign. A week after that, in Alaska, another Democrat won another special election in the House, this time flipping a seat from red to blue, also running on a pro-abortion rights platform. I should mention, only 12 percent of Alaska voters are Democrats, but the Democrat won that seat. Then a few months later, in November 2022, we had the first big nationwide election since they overturned Roe. And more Democrats ran aggressive campaigns focused on reproductive rights. And in those elections in November 2022, Republicans suffered historically poor results, the worst for an opposition party in decades. Beyond the congressional races that day, there were five more states that put abortion directly on the ballot. And in all five of those states, voters moved toward abortion rights and away from abortion restrictions. The reproductive rights victories continued the following year, affecting the race for a Supreme Court on the Wisconsin, excuse me, affecting the race for a seat on the Wisconsin Supreme Court uh, and the race for the Kentucky governorship and the race for control of the legislature in Virginia. Also, the state constitution in Ohio, where voters chose to enshrine the right to have an abortion in the Ohio state constitution. Since the fall of Roe two years ago today, the political impact has been indelible and stark and remarkably consistent. And that has been bolstered by what the overturning of Roe has changed in the minds of the American people. It's, it's a new understanding that the question of reproductive rights is not just about accessing abortion. It is about what happens if you have a miscarriage or you go into septic shock during pregnancy, or you have any other dangerous form of complication and you can't access healthcare because the state you live in has banned abortion. 
One pollster telling the New York Times today that before Roe fell, the percentage of the public that considered abortion personally relevant to them was as low as about 15 percent. But in the post-Roe landscape that we live in now, that has changed. Her more recent polling asked independent voters about the stories of women almost dying because they live in states that have banned abortion. Of independent voters she polled who support abortion rights, the number who said those stories will affect how they will vote in upcoming elections is 73 percent. The pollster tells The New York Times, quote, now it's about pregnancy and everybody knows someone who had a baby or wants to have a baby or might get pregnant. It is profoundly personal to a majority of the public. Joining us now is Amy Klobuchar, Democratic Senator from the great state of Minnesota. She's a member of the Judiciary Committee. Senator Klobuchar, it's really nice to see you. Thank you so much for making time to be here. Thanks, Rachel. It's great to be on again. So today is the two-year anniversary since Roe was overturned. We know a lot about the human cost. Um, we know about, for example, new research just published in, published in the journal of the American Medical Association, which says that um, it has adversely and seriously affected infant mortality in that state with its with its profound abortion ban. What do you think is most important for the American public to understand on this two-year anniversary since the decision was made for the country? You know, I think everyone remembers where they were when this thought to be leaked opinion was you found out it was a real opinion. I was at the getting my hair cut and there's a line of four women at the hairdressers and everyone in the place said that just can't be true. And two mm -hmm. years later, oh, we know how true it is. Fifty years of freedoms just thrown out the window. You've got IVF affected. Eight million babies were born that way. You've got contraception affected. You have got uh, doctors in fear of criminal prosecution. You've got women bleeding out in parking lots because they are told in an emergency room, hey, you got to be more serious. We know you're in bad health, but we've got to be kind of near death to be able to get the kind of treatment you need. One in three women are now living in a state with an extreme abortion ban. That is our current reality, Rachel, but it does not have to be our future. And that's what you see in these states all across the country, with people turning out on the prairies, people turning out for referendums and for governor's races and U.S. Senate races and, of course, the presidency. Because it is so clear, and you're going to hear this on that debate stage, when one of the candidates, Donald Trump, said he is proud to be the person responsible for overturning Roe. And then you've got Joe Biden vowing to codify Roe v. Wade into law, so long as we elect these candidates and we know we need to take back the House and win these Senate races. That is what is at stake in this election. I think that a lot of people who are strongly for abortion rights, whether they were before this decision or they newly are strongly for abortion rights, worry that this is something that the Supreme Court has taken on, that Republican legislatures have taken on, and they've effectively taken it out of the hands of somebody like Joe Biden, who supports abortion rights, that when he talks about codifying Roe versus Wade, I'm not sure people know what that means in terms of what it would do in all of these states where state laws, where Republican legislators and Republican governors have enforced these bans. Well, we know it is time to have a national standard, which is Roe v. Wade. That will guarantee our freedoms, because what Trump has now said um, is that he wants to return it to the states. What does that mean? Look at what these states are doing. One state, Texas, with that Trump-appointed judge, and yes, the judges are on the line here, the Trump-appointed judge banning mifepristone. Uh, you've got another state where they're going to criminally prosecute doctors. Another state says they don't want to have people cross lines to get their reproductive health care. State by state by state, you saw governors racing to their state house to see how draconian they could be to kiss the ring of Donald Trump. That is what is going on right now. So that is a clear difference. And I think, as you showed with your proof points from across the country, people do see the difference. They know that there is one person who's going to stand up for them, and then there's Donald Trump, who has vowed over the years everything he has said, from, yes, he'd prosecute uh, doctors, to, yes, he would look at a national ban, to, yes, most recently, hey, let's give it back to the states. Look at the patchwork of laws that we have had that have hurt the women of this country. 
Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar, uh, thank you so much for your time tonight. It's the anniversary now, but we're also in this very, very, very acute political moment uh, when I think people are really focusing in on how much this is tied to what happens next, these next political decisions we make as a country. Thanks for helping us understand it. Exactly. Thanks, Rachel. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russert, and be sure to join me, Rachel Maddow, Jen Psaki, Lawrence O'Donnell, Steve Kornacki, Joy Reid, and many more, September 7th in Brooklyn, MSNBC Live Democracy 2024. Click on the link for ticket information. We will see you there.